rest of the screen to you. Okay, uh, can you see my screen yet? Uh, let's see. No, not yet. I'm going to make you a presenter now. Okay. Okay, I think, we, I think we're good to go now. I see your screen. Um, all right, Daniel. Okay. Take it away. Thank you, Andres. Um, very happy to be presenting this webinar today on fractions, decimals, and place value. Uh, this is kind of a special webinar for me in that the materials I'm going to be showing you are ones that the general public by and large hasn't seen yet. Uh, these are models that we've been working on during the last two years as part of a new project at KCP Technologies and that's been the dynamic number project. And the goal of that project has been to look at ways of extending Sketchpad into the elementary grades and to be thinking about how to use it for things like fractions, decimals, um, even early algebra. So today you're going to be seeing some brand new models that we've been making over the last few months. And I would encourage you to ask questions and to give us some feedback about these models. Because these are very new models and any feedback about them will be very helpful as we move forward. So on our agenda today, we're going to be looking at several models for decimals. And we're going to also be looking at a bunch of models for fractions. Throughout the webinar, you'll have a chance to type questions into the panel. And we'll pause every so often so that Andres can pass on some of your questions to me and I can answer them. And uh, at the end of the workshop, I'm going to be sharing with you some information about the resources available. And what you should know now is that everything I'm showing you today, these sketches and these activities, are going to be available for you to download after the webinar, as well as a video recording of this webinar itself. So I would suggest just sitting back, relaxing, and watching the webinar. And everything that you'll need in order to be able to use these models will be provided to you after the webinar is over. So today we have with us Scott Steckity, who's my partner in the Dynamic Number Project. We have Elizabeth DeCarly and Andres, who's hosting the webinar. And before I begin the intro, I'd actually like to start with a survey question, just as a way of getting you involved in the webinar and also to find out some information. So. I believe I can launch the poll from my computer here. You can. Our I'm first good. poll. Oh, I think I did. Do you see it? Yep. The question I is, do you use technology to teach decimals and fractions? Yes or no? And I'm getting some results in now. And looks like we're getting close. Okay. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So do you use technology? Uh, we have 41% yes and 59% no. Okay. Well, I hope those numbers will change a little bit after today's poll. So. I'd like to say a little bit about what I mean when I'm talking about dynamic number in this webinar. So for those of you who have used Sketchpad before, you might think of it primarily as a tool for studying geometry, or perhaps algebra and pre-calculus and calculus. But Sketchpad undeniably, I think in terms of what people think about first, is probably the geometry aspect and this notion of dynamic geometry. And that's something that Key Curriculum Press pioneered, 
And a good example of that is just this triangle I drew here. Now this is just a static triangle, but in a sense it represents every triangle I could want because I can just take any vertex here and drag it and change my triangle. So I'm not seeing just one triangle, in a sense I'm seeing all triangles. So we began to wonder, with this notion of dynamic geometry being so powerful, what would that mean to apply it to something like number? What is a dynamic number? So one example we have here are these numbers uh, A and B, which in Sketchpad uh, language we call parameters. And here A is equal to 1, but I can change the value of A and I can make it something like 5. I can also select it and using the plus key on my keyboard, I can increment its value and watch it go up or go down. In the same way I can select B, but B when I use the plus and minus key, that increments by tenths. So I'm definitely seeing something about our number system here by using this very simple way of changing the values of A and B. And the question is, can we use things like this to help us dig deeper into the underlying structure of numbers? So what would it mean to explore the structure of decimals and fractions? And in particular, Sketchpad is such a wonderful tool for being able to visualize mathematical phenomenon and see them in action as we drag. What would it mean to see a number visually? What would it mean to be able to interact with that? And in particular, in terms of fractions, since we're going to be talking about fractions today, what would it mean and what are the pedagogical benefits of being able to have any fraction, or I should say, in fact, any fraction or decimal at your fingertips? Um, not just the standard ones of one half and one third and one fourth. What would it mean as a student if you could create immediately an accurate model of, say, 13 over 99? So we're going to be exploring those questions today. And we're going to be starting by looking at uh, decimals. Okay, let me just make sure I haven't forgotten a poll question. Okay, not yet. So, decimal models. I'd like to start with this view of a number line. And here we have a number line from 0 to 10. And there's a point on that number line. And when we use this activity with students, we'll start by asking, what do you think the location of that point is? And students might say a number of things. They might say, well, it looks like it's a little more than 6. Or, oh, it's between 6 and 7. And some students might even say, I think it's 6.1. So we have all sorts of different responses students give. And we ask students to imagine what would happen if we took a magnifying glass and we were able to concentrate on that interval between 6 and 7 and zoom in so we can see a much finer picture of what's happening between 6 and 7. Well, with Sketchpad and this model, we have a way to zoom in, and that's the zoom button over here. So I'm going to press zoom, and let's watch what happens to that interval between 6 and 7. So notice on our second number line that now we're seeing an expanded view of the interval from 6 to 7, and that interval has been subdivided with these tick marks. So our first question might be, well, what has it been subdivided into? And we can talk with students about, oh, these are actually tenths that we're looking at, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, all the way up to 6.9 and 7. And we see the same point that we had before that was somewhere between 6 and 7. We now can be much more definitive about its location. We see that it's at 6.2, or 6 and 2 tenths. And we can show its location, and indeed, that's where it's at. And we can use this model repeatedly to get at this idea of tenths. I can press Reset, and I can hide the location. 
And then I can drag this point along my number line, or students can, and stop anywhere we'd like. And again, try to estimate the location, and then zoom in. And again, the location of the point is to the exact tenth. Now, before I talked about the role of dynamism, of what happens when you're dragging an object to the sketch pad. So here we drag the point to a new location to create this new problem. But what would it look like if we were to animate this point on the first number line and have it move very slowly along? What might we expect to see happen here with this point, which is really the same point, only zoomed in? So we have an animate button here, and let's watch what happens. So notice as this point is moving, now between 8 and 9, we see this point below moving more quickly. And it's each time we go from 8 to 9 or 9 to 10, oops, let's move it back. We see that as this point moves from 1 to 2, we see this point on the number line below makes its way from uh, 1 to 2, but doing it in tenths. So every time this point moves 10 times, between 10 ticks, this point on the first number line is going just between the two consecutive integers. So we get to see something about place value by watching this movement. Now to continue, we can zoom in even more. So again, we start with a point on a number line. We ask students to approximate its location. And then we zoom in. This time, however, our location of the point isn't exact to tenths. We see that our point is somewhere between, oh, 3.1 and 3.2. So we could again ask students to approximate where they think it's at. Uh, maybe it's at 3.5. And again, I'll zoom in. And we see, oh, OK, it's at 3.1. Four. And for those of you who remember that yesterday, March 14th, was Pi Day, this is my little tribute to Pi Day. So again, you can play this same game again, just dragging this point to different locations. You can also animate the point, and this time watch the behavior here as this point on the third number line is moving in hundredths, the second number line in tenths, and the first number line from unit to unit. So again, it gives us some structure to the underlying nature of the decimal system. Daniel, can I break in for yes. one second and ask if you can uh, reset your monitor to a lower resolution because we've had, we've had requests from uh, some of the participants that they have trouble seeing the, the window, which is too small relative to your full screen. Okay, let's see. Oh, wait. That's great. That looks good. Um, that doesn't look good for me. No. Um. Ten twenty four by seven sixty eight should be a good choice. How's that? Looks good from here. Looks great. Uh, okay. Thanks. Sure. So we have several other decimal models here. Um, we have here the ability to zoom in to get to thousandths. And our final zooming model, just to show that quickly because I want to move on. Here when we zoom in, I zoom to tenths, then hundredths, 
twenty thousands, and I can keep going. Here, even after I've zoomed in four times, I still don't have this point on an exact tick mark. And if I show the location of this point, we have it revealed to many, many decimal places. And this model, which is the culmination of all of these zooming decimal models that we've seen, really highlights this notion that as you zoom in, you can zoom in some more, and again, and again, and each time when you zoom in, it's going to be that same structure that you see with 10 tick marks from tenths to hundredths to thousandths and beyond, and that you can keep going and drill down farther and farther and see that this location can be ever more precise. So now I'd just like to show one other model for decimals today. And this is a model uh, that involves something that we informally call a scooting tick mark. And I'll show you why we call it scooting. So I'm going to start by pressing go. And here's our scooting tick mark. It's currently sitting at 0 0.8. And our goal is to have this tick mark scoot over to this tick mark over here that's in orange. And to do so, we need to enter what the location of this tick mark is. So let's see. This is at 0 0.8. And that looks like around 0 0.9. So if I look at that distance from 0 0.9 to 1, that looks like about the same distance from 0 to the orange tick mark. So I'm going to estimate it's at 0 0.1. So I'm going to type 0 0.1. And when I enter that, off this blue tick mark scoots right over to the orange. And look at that. It looks like I did pretty well. I can check my value. And ah, it's at 0 0.1. And I can then play again. I can press New Target. And the orange tick mark will scoot to new locations that are always exact to tenths. So after a while, students get pretty good at this uh, pretty quickly. So our next challenge is to find the value of this tick mark here, the orange tick mark, to the nearest hundredth. So again, I'll start by pressing go. And what should I guess for this one? Um, I don't know, maybe 0 0.8. Let's see how that does. Oh, I overshot it. OK, well, let's back up a little. Let's try 0 0.7. OK, so I'm pretty clear now I'm between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. I've done what a lot of students do, which is to work first with tenths. And this is a good way of having them think about place value because tenths allow us to sort of narrow down which interval we're looking at here. We're somewhere between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. Um, so where are we? Oh, how about, uh, let's say 0 0.5. OK, pretty close. 0 0.7. I don't know, oh, got to back up a little. Oh, wait, I already entered that. Ah, sorry. Let's try 0 0.76 and press go. Ah, there I got it. And as before, I can press new target and get new locations. And what was interesting to uh, me watching students solve this problem was, one, they found it a lot of fun. There's nothing high tech going on here in terms of any sort of animations or um, any kind of sound coming out of the machines. But just this um, task of trying to hit the target exactly was very compelling to students. And you might think, well, you know, they're going to be satisfied if they get it pretty close. Well, they weren't. They wanted exactly to the nearest hundredth. And they, students, in third, fourth, and fifth grade will play this game quite intently trying to get the target to be exact. Um, so this is a good example of a sketch where I'd be very curious with any of you who are using this model after the webinar today to send us your feedback and let us know how it goes for you because I'd be really curious to know. So Andres, I'm going to turn it back to you for a second to see if we have any questions. So um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, not really. The, the, it's great looking now that it's big. That was the concern we had. <clears throat> but it looks really great. 
with the higher resolution. And if, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to us. But so far, I haven't seen any questions. So carry on. Okay. Thanks. So now we're going to turn to fractions. And I'm going to ask the next of our polling questions. And that question is, which of these models, if any, do you use to teach fractions? Do you use area models, number line models, or perhaps neither? So let us know and take the poll. So we have what looks like a pretty close neck and neck tie with area models and number line models with some people using neither. I'm not quite sure what's going on with those percentages. Oh, well, I, <coughs> I set it up so that people didn't have to choose between them. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're, you could answer both. Okay. It's only fair, right? Yeah. So, to be fair to both area models and number line models, we're going to look at both. And we're going to start with area models. And our first challenge here is to make five fractions that are less than one. And these are our choices for numerators and denominators. We can use any number here in this list from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 60, 80, 90, and 100. So here's how we're going to make the fractions. I'm going to go over here to Custom Tools, and I'm going to choose Make Fraction with Circles. Now I'm going to actually click on the numerator and denominator of the fraction I want to build. So what should I make? Well, 1 half is always a good choice for a fraction less than 1. So I'm going to click 1, and then click 2. And when I move away, I now have in my control this fraction circle showing me 1 half, and I can click anywhere to place it. There's 1 half. So let's make another fraction less than a half, uh, less than 1. How about 1? And now I'll click on 4. And there's 1 fourth. Just like that. Okay, well those were pretty standard fractions. How about something a little more weird? Uh, how about 13 as the numerator? And how about 60 as my denominator? Can Sketchpad handle that? Oh, look, there we go, 13 sixtieths. How about that? Daniel, I just got to interrupt this. Can I just interrupt and say, this is so cool. This is awesome, and I'm getting that from some people out there, too. I'm glad you're hearing that. because this is, this, this is awesome. This Anyways. is the kind of thing that when... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'll let you carry oh, no, on. No, no, please. This is the kind of thing that when we show it to students, they absolutely love this. Uh, the fraction they want to make first, in fact, is not one half. They want to go straight to something like one one hundredth. They just love the ability to make any fraction they want and to see an accurate picture of it. Uh, the other thing they really like being able to do is go down here to the segment that's in the corner. And if I drag either endpoint, I can make my fractions bigger and smaller, but retain their same value. So if I'm making lots of fractions, I might want to make this small. If I'm only making one or two, I might want to make these really big and space them out. So now the question that comes up is, okay, this is a really neat tool. And yeah, okay, I expect it to make fractions that are less than one. How about fractions that are greater than one? I bet you can't do that. Well, let's take a look. Go back to the tool. And let's start with something like, how about three halves? 
So I'll click on three and then two. And oh, look, three halves. And at this point, students don't even have to really know anything about improper fractions. This is really just a chance for them to start playing with these numbers and see what happens. Um, so how about six fourths? Again, I'm playing very timid with these. Let's do what students are going to do. They're going to do 100, and let's do 1. And whoa, look at this. How many circles do I have here? Well, if I scroll, I can go and go and go and, oh boy, Ooh, all the way over there. And let's bring this back. So this is a mighty good time to come back here to my segment, which controls the size of these circles and see, wow, 100 divided by one. There are a lot of circles there. In fact, there are 100. So again, the world of fractions at your fingertips. For fractions that are greater than one, students can begin to play with this. It's one of their first introductions to working with this model. Don't have to know a lot about fractions to start. So now that we've given students a chance to play, let's be a little more systematic. So now we have just one fraction, which starts as a half. And I'd like to look at what happens to this fraction as the, the, uh, the denominator increases one by one. So I'm going to select it, and I'm going to use the plus key on my keyboard to increment its value. So I'm going to hit plus to go from, one, uh, from two to three, and one-fourth, one-fifth, one-sixth, one-seventh. And we can look at, in a very graphic, dynamic way, what happens to a fraction as its uh, denominator increases. Does the fraction get larger, which some students might think, or does it get smaller? So I can hold the plus key and watch what happens as this very quickly becomes a very small fraction. And students, of course, really like to see this as it gets this part that's shaded smaller and smaller. Um, right now we're doing this one by one. We could just double click on this number and quickly enter another number. Uh, for instance, students will ask to see something like 500. So I'll enter 500 and click OK. And we can see that. And again, this is something that generates tons of oohs and ahs. And also gets students to remember what exactly the behavior of a fraction is as the fraction's denominator gets larger. And I think that's very important to mention that this is the behavior of a fraction. We don't often talk about fractions as having behaviors. With Sketchpad, we think about things like maybe triangles having behaviors, but here we see a very dynamic experiment with the fraction and see that it does indeed have a behavior. And it's something that students remember because it's very, very dynamic. Uh, in this next sketch here, to show how this moves on, the challenge is to make as many fractions as you can with the denominator one larger than the numerator. And we ask which fraction is closest to one. So again, I can choose my tool, and I can make fractions like 20 21sts, 30 31sts, 40 41sts, 80 81sts. And I can see, if I want to, just by dragging one fraction onto the other here, that as my numbers are getting larger, the fraction is getting closer and closer to one. And again, I have a graphic way I can show this. I'm again returning to a model showing just one fraction. But in this model, as I use the plus key to increase the numerator, we'll notice that the uh, denominator is always one larger than the numerator. And I can watch this pattern as I make the numerator larger and larger. And I see my fraction getting closer and closer to 1. Same kind of thing we did before, just looking at a slightly different question. I can do a similar type of experiment here, where we're trying to make fractions that are as close as one, uh, as close to one half as possible, but remaining less than one half. So for instance, 10 is less than half of 22, so I might make 10 20 seconds. I might make 15 30 seconds. These are all very conveniently lined up one below the other. 
I uh, could make 20, 40 seconds, or I could make 25, 50 seconds. And again, I can see as my numbers are getting larger, my fraction is getting closer to one half. And I can see that here in the sketchpad model where the denominator is always two more than, uh, than twice the numerator. And as my numerator is getting very large, it gets very difficult, in fact, to see that this fraction is not exactly one half. Something we haven't talked about yet, equivalent fractions. If we want to make fractions that are equal to one half, we can start with one half as our baseline fraction. And then we can create other fractions that are equal to it with different numerators and denominators, like 2 fourths, uh, 6 twelfths. Uh, let's do something a little more interesting, like 30 sixtieths, or say 50 one hundredths. And if I want, I can drag one fraction onto the other. I can even go here and change the color of my fractions. So maybe I want one shaded in blue, one in red, and one in pink. So that's perhaps easier to see when I drag one onto the other. And I can also, as before, change their size. So here, if I start with one half and increase the numerator, I have that same model. In this case, the denominator is always twice the numerator. So after kids see this for a while, they begin to wonder, how did I build this? How did I make this so that the denominator was always twice the numerator? And a nice connection for early algebra is that we ask students to actually make this model themselves. So we're going to start with um, n equals 1, with n as our numerator. And we want to make the denominator, in this case, 2. But n is going to vary. n can be 1, n can be 2, 3, 4, and so on. And we always want the denominator to be twice the numerator. So with Sketchpad, I can go to the calculator. And in the calculator, I can calculate 2 times n. Now, I could just calculate 2 times 9. But that's not going to update as the value of n changes. I want to be able to do a calculation so that no matter what the value of n, the denominator will always be twice n. So I'm going to calculate 2 times, and then come back over here to the sketch and click on n itself. So I'm calculating 2 times n, and then press OK. And so now, as I change the value of n by using the plus key on my keyboard, I see that 2n always remains equal to twice the value of n, just as I want. So now that I have these two values, I can go over here to my Make Fraction tool. I can click on n and then 2n. And there's my fraction. And as I change the value of n, it behaves just the way I would want. Moving on. So, uh, Daniel, I'm going to... Yeah. I'm going to just ask a couple of questions real quick. Uh, some mm -hmm. comments, too. Uh, just uh, some people are being, um, are being very, uh, making good points that I want to share. You know, one thing to be careful about is not to say if the fraction is getting larger and smaller, the, the circle is getting larger and smaller, but the fraction, in fact, stays yeah. the same And when, when you drag the slider. Um, I also noticed at one point earlier it looked like you had a choice of doing circular fractions and rectangular, and a question's come up about that. So I don't know if you were going to show. Yes, right. I am. Okay. I'm and, actually uh, about to uh, show the rectangular uh, okay. tool. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and do that, and I'll come back. Holding that one off until the end of this uh, set of activities. Okay. The, 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 oh. I'll, I'll uh, come back later. Okay. Thank you. So here, I'd like to look at what happens as we keep increasing the numerator of this fraction. So I'm going to change it from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. And a very good question that comes up next when we're doing this with students is, what do you think will happen next? And there are a number of different answers that students will propose. 
And with the Sketchpad model, we can take a look and see. I'm going to make it six, and we see now we have this new circle also divided into fifths, with just one of those fifths shaded, but we have altogether six fifths shaded. And we can continue to increase the numerator. Now we have ten fifths, or two. And we can keep on going, and students can examine this pattern and not just see one finished representation of an improper fraction like we did before, but we can actually watch as the numerator grows to see what happens to our visual representation. Now some people do not like this model of using circles. They look at this and they say, well, okay, there are eight parts shaded, but a student could look at this and rightly say, well, there are ten equal parts altogether, so this doesn't have to be eight-fifths, maybe it's eight-tenths. And they have a good point. So we've provided a separate model, which I hope begins to address that a little, and this is the model of making fractions that uses a rectangle. So I'm going to create one-fifth, again starting with one-fifth. So now instead of a circle divided into equal parts, now we have this rectangle divided into five strips that are equal. And let's watch what happens in this case. We're going to go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. And now when we go to 6, we're adding another strip, but it's not going to be a separate rectangle over here. We're just adding a strip beyond this rectangle that's highlighted here in purple. So we're going to 6, to 7, to 8, to 9. And when we get to 10, we do get this border here appearing around this second set of five strips, indicating that we have this second hole. But it's in a more muted shade of gray, and we're hoping that that helps to settle this issue of what's the unit. It's still probably an issue that's going to come up, but the use of rectangles here as opposed to circles might be something that we think helps students to address this issue of looking at improper fractions in an area model. And this is something, again, that testing would be the best way to tell, and it'd be something I'd be curious to get your feedback to. Uh, so I'm going to pause here and ask if there are any questions. Well, there was actually the question about whether the, you know, if, if there's any research that's been done on the circular models versus the rectangular models as far as how effective it is for student understanding. Well, the advisor to, um, evaluation advisor to our project, uh, John Olive, who is very well known for um, his research on fractions, he was really the one who pushed for this uh, model that uses rectangles. Um, also, another person who's done a lot of work on this is Barbara Dougherty. Um, she's, I believe, at uh, University of Iowa. And both of them uh, strongly pushed for having us uh, include this use of rectangles and not just stop by showing circles. Okay, and then a, another question, uh, just since you've been using this in the classroom with kids, uh, somebody was wondering with younger kids in grades three and four, do they get distracted by the sort of sketchpad venues and the sketchpad toolbar? Um, in honesty, they have an easier time with it than the teachers do. Um, I would say that the fact that they see all these uh, tools over here that allow them to draw are things that often on the very first day of ske using Sketchpad will give them that opportunity to use them so that when it comes time to doing something with number where they're focusing, in this case for instance, just on using these custom tools, they're not going to have the same distraction of wanting to come back here and make a circle, for example. Um, on the other hand, sometimes these tools turn out to be useful in terms of the numerical work we're doing, in terms of building a model from scratch. Um, so kids do get excited and sometimes distracted, but I think once they start using these tools, they become so engrossed in that um, that they really focus pretty quickly on the task at hand. Okay, great, thanks.
So we're going to move on. You're going to move on to uh, just so you know, it's about 20 minutes left. Okay, I am going to um, move reasonably quickly now to show a bunch of new models, um, but we'll get to what we can get to. Here we have a model where we have two points along a number line, and we'd like to identify their locations in terms of the fractional values. And we have two sets of um, segments down here which we can use to do that. We have two blue segments uh, which represent the unit fraction one fifth, and we have two green segments that represent the unit fraction one eleventh. So what I can do is I can take this uh, segment here, which is one-fifth, and I can say, well, this point over here looks like it's about one-fifth, and if I put that on top, yeah, that really does look like one-fifth, so that's probably one-fifth. And this point over here, well, I'm going to take this other segment because we're always going to be using both sets uh, to measure the locations of these points. I'm going to put one-eleventh and then put next to that another one-eleventh, and I haven't reached it yet, so I'm going to then move this over and then move it over again. So it looks like altogether I've used four 1 11 strips, so I can either look at that as 1 minus 4 11 to figure out this location, or I can say, well, I did 4 11 going from right to left, so that should mean that if I if went from left to right, I would use 7 1 11 so if I check my answers to see if I have one-fifth and seven-elevenths, indeed I do. And what's nice about this sketchpad model is that I don't have to then say, okay, I've just done the game, I'm done. I can press new problem, and each time I do, I get new random locations for these two points between zero and one. And I also get different denominators here for my unit fractions. For the blue segments, I get denominators that are from 5 to 8. And for my green segments, I get denominators that are from 9 to 12. So it creates a whole wealth of challenges just by clicking New Problem. So now I would like to show another model of fractions on number lines. And here our goal is to make fractions with a denominator of 5 that add up to 1. So how am I going to make the fractions? Well again I'm going to use a custom tool and this tool is called as before make fraction and I'm going to click on a numerator and then a denominator and this time, rather than give me a circle, I get a segment that's labeled as one-fifth. So I can move over here to my first number line and click to place the segment so that its left endpoint is at zero. So there's one-fifth. And if I want fractions with a denominator of five that add up to one, I better create some more fractions. So one-fifth, one-fifth. And let's see, that's getting a little slow, so maybe now I should consolidate some of those one-fifths and make a three-fifths fraction with a uh, segment of length three-fifths. So here I have one-fifth plus one-fifth plus three-fifths equals one. And I can use these number lines below to find other ways to reach one. I can create two-fifths plus two-fifths plus one-fifth. I can use all one-fifths all the different ways I might want to do this on all of these different number lines here. So now let's look at a different sum. This time I'd like to make fractions that add up to 9 tenths, but my choice of numbers for the numerator and denominator is more limited. I only have 1 and 10. So let's see. I can create 1 tenth, which gets me on my way. So that leaves 8 tenths. So I can make another 1 tenth. I don't really have a lot of choice here. I can just keep on building this. And it's pretty slow, but I could make 9 of these 1 tenths and have them reach 9 tenths. 
So that's not ideal, but it works. So let's look at the same problem again, but now with the addition of a 2 in the list. So I have 1, 2, and 10. So this time, uh, let's see, I can start with 110. And that is, in fact, a pretty good strategy because that leaves me with 8 tenths. And 8 is an even number. And that 8 can be divided into 2s. So I can now do, for instance, 2 tenths, 2 tenths, 2 tenths, and another 2 tenths. So easier than it was before by having that 2 available to us. Here we have a different set of numbers, and I might again think of that same strategy of, well, well I have 9 here, and that's an odd number. Da Maybe Daniel? Just, uh, yeah. On the last screen, with, I mean, you could also do 1 half, right? That's right. Okay. In fact, that's the strategy I'm going to show here. Oh, okay. But yeah, absolutely. Here I could do, for example, 4 tenths, which leaves 5 tenths remaining. And 5 tenths, or 1 half, can be broken into 1 fourth and 1 fourth. So the surprising part to me in doing these problems is that when I was coming up with these numbers here and thinking that maybe there would just be one solution or two, it often turned out that there was more than two ways of doing it, which made these particularly rich problems to share with students because you want to be able to give them problems where they can share their thinking and solve problems in multiple ways. Here I just show you as an example uh, a page where students can create their own problems just like the ones that you saw. They can type in numbers here to replace the question marks and in place of all of these ones they can just double click and enter a new number. So that's that set of models and I just want to move through to the last two to make sure I show you at least one page from each. So here the goal is to find one nine and this time we can add and subtract fractions. So let's look at one quick example of that. To find 1 ninth, I'm going to create that as 4 ninths and then subtract 3 ninths. So I'll use my add fraction tool to create 4 ninths. That's our blue segment. And now I'm going to switch to subtract fraction. And this time I'm going to subtract 3 ninths. Now I have a red segment, and this one I'm controlling by the right endpoint, as compared to before, where I controlled it by the left endpoint. And I can take this segment here and attach it to the right endpoint of 4 ninths, so that I see 4 ninths and then minus 3 ninths, which gives me 1 ninth. And as with the previous set of problems where we were just adding fractions, we can create new problems just by using new numbers, and each one gives a variety of ways to solve it. Uh, for instance, 6 thirteenths, we could think of as 5 thirteenths plus 5 thirteenths minus 4 thirteenths. Or we could even do uh, something like 5 thirteenths plus 5 thirteenths plus 5 thirteenths plus 4 thirteenths, which gives us 19 thirteenths, and then subtract from that 13 thirteenths. So we can get some pretty creative solutions going. So I'm sorry I'm moving through these fairly quickly, but again, you're going to be getting these sketches and you'll be able to play with them and really explore the problems in more depth than I'm able to here. Uh, the last model of fraction, yeah? No, it's fine. I was just going to say um, people are pretty happy with, uh, it's pretty, you know, these are pretty exciting models to see and just go ahead and keep on presenting. I don't see uh, questions coming up so much. As okay. People people being excited by the models. So and, uh, and, and people are, uh, I got some really positive feedback on the rectangular model. It seems really well thought out in terms of addressing that issue. That is really good to hear because this is the first debut that rectangle model has had. And I was a bit worried showing it to you all today. So this final um, activity with fractions, and you can see we're really pushing very hard on fractions and the work we've done lately, is a model of where we're going to find fractions through a process of dividing and subdividing. 
And to give an example of that, we'd like to find here the uh, location on our number line of 1 16th. We have a variety of tools. We have halves, thirds, fourths, all the way up to sevenths. And I'm going to find 1 16th just by using halves. So the way this tool works is that I'm going to click on the endpoints of the segment that I'd like to split in half. So I'm going to click on zero. And as I now move, I have this stretchy segment, which is divided in two, no matter where I move it. And I'm going to click on one. And that splits the segment in half. And my goal is to find 1 16th. So it might help me to actually label uh, this point. And since we're dealing with 16th, I'm going to label the fraction with uh, 16 in the denominator. So rather than label it as 1 half, I'm going to label it as 8 sixteenths. And that gives me here right away this little label with 8 sixteenths. And I'm also going to label for completeness 1 as 16 sixteenths. So for 1 sixteenth, in order to find that, I'm going to need to do some more splitting. So I'm going to go back to halves and split again. And that gives me 4 sixteenths, which I can then label. I can then split again to give me 2 sixteenths. And one last time here to give me 1 sixteenth. So I could label all of those. Here I'm just going to label 1 sixteenth. This is the most economical way of doing it. For some students, it might very well be necessary to go through and add all of the other halves here and to keep going along with that. And in the second example, where we're looking at twelfths, we now get to use some more tools. I could start, for example, to find twelfths by dividing my segment into thirds. Now that I have thirds, if I want to find twelfths, I'm going to need to take each of those thirds and divide it into fourths. So I can go to fourths and apply my fourths tool to each of those parts. And the nice thing about this is I can use these tools in a very different order. I could do fourths first, followed by thirds. I could do, let's see, sixths, followed by halves halves followed by sixths. A lot of nice ways I can go about the same problem and get some pretty different things about fractions than we did with the previous models. So the goal in all of these models is that by using different kinds of tools, they expose different aspects of fractions. So just to return to where we started, um, this webinar today you will be receiving a uh, condensed zip file with the materials from the webinar, everything I've shown you today. We'll be giving you a link to the webinar recording so that you can watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And I want to put a big plug in here for the Dynamic Number Curriculum page and website. And this is the website where all of our new materials from the Dynamic Number Project are getting posted. So if you go to this link, you will find full activities for many of the activities that I've shown you today. Some of the newest activities, um, we don't have up uh, write-ups for them yet, but we will in the coming weeks. And if you go back to this source over uh, every month for this website, you should be finding new activities over the next two years. So it's a great place to see what we're doing, and it's also a place where I encourage you to download the materials, try them out, and send us feedback. And finally, I want to give a plug to Sketchpad Lesson Link. Um, this is a subscription service uh, with an online database of over 500 Sketchpad activities for grades 3 through 12. And in that collection, you will find even more activities with decimals and fractions beyond what I've shown you today. OK, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Andres. All right. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to send them in now. Uh, we're going, we just have a couple Andre? of minutes. Yes, Elizabeth? Hi, it's Elizabeth. Um, I just wanted to say we got a, a couple um, good tips 
through the chat panel that you might not have seen. One is that, um, Daniel, in the last model you were showing, um, we got the suggestion of, of adding the ability to be able to label zero with, like, a zero sixteenth. So I thought that was an interesting point. Um, and the other tip was that Barb Do Doherty is at Iowa State. Iowa State, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, Daniel, thank you very much for your presentation. Some fascinating new models that you guys are working on, and it's very exciting to see them. As they were new for me as well. Um, I don't see any last questions coming in, so I'm going to just thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. And um, as Daniel was telling you, they'll be uh, you'll have access. You'll be receiving an email right after you close out of this session. There's a survey. We would love it if you would give us some feedback on the webinar itself, and then you'll be receiving an email that will give you the access to the zip file with the materials from today. Um, also, I'm going to, let's see if I can, uh, I was going to let you know about our next upcoming um, presentation, which uh, is happening in April. And uh, we'll, I'll, I'll actually be presenting uh, Modeling Periodic Phenomena. And that will be on April 19th and April 20th. So feel free to, to come back for a, another webinar on Sketchpad. And uh, seeing that there's no other questions, uh, once again, thanks okay. for joining us. Scott? Okay. Yes. I'm going to speak up because, unless I'm mistaken, we're also doing a special webinar, um, which is not part of the regular schedule, in a week that doesn't have anything else scheduled. And that is, is the 29th of March a Tuesday? I don't have my calendar in front of me. Yes, here it is. No, I'm sorry. It's yes, the 29th and 30th of March. You're right. Um, we have a special session on the 29th and 30th of March. I've forgotten about those because it's a, it's a bonus webinar for the month of March because we have the fifth week. So, a, um, and that one you're presenting, is that correct, Scott? Yes, it'll be exploring mathematical iteration through Sketchpad. And I think it's only on the 29th. I think we're only doing one day because okay. it's, not a regular, it's not a regular webinar. All right, so probably be at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday the 29th. Great. Thank you well, people, if you're interested in that, keep a look out for it. I uh, see also a question about the PD certificate. Yeah, that's also going to be part of what happens with the, um, you'll get a separate email for that. And, uh, as Scott was saying, on the 29th, Tuesday the 29th, we'll have a special webinar about iteration using sketch, iteration of Sketchpad. And then we'll have that be back to our regular scheduled monthly Sketchpad webinar is at April 19th and 20th for modeling periodic phenomena of the Sketchpad. All right, so thanks again, Daniel, for presenting. Thanks, Elizabeth and Scott, for answering people's questions. Thanks for all of you for joining us, including some people, friends of ours out there that we haven't seen in a while. Take care.